Hello YouTubers. In the last video we talked about how to integrate an ASP.NET Core application with Cosmos DB using the Entity Framework and adding OData on top of that and taking advantage of uh, querying, navigating through that data through uh, Cosmos DB using the power of OData. Uh, in this video today I'm going to add in another block in this beautiful long uh, blocks of uh, development components that helps publish and show your data, uh, visualize your data on the front end using a technology called Blazor. Blazor is a new technology developed by Daniel Roth and his team to help people write C -sharp code in the browser. So let's start talking about, you know, first of all, let's start talking about pulling in data. Let's first of all, let's verify that our solution still works the same way we lift it to be. So let's run the application. just to make sure that the data that we had is still working as expected. So we have slash API slash students, and then you have a bunch of students, and now let's verify that OData is still working. So if I do select equal name, here is your data, just the name. Uh, so now we know that OData is working, but the problem with, with this solution though is that I can't get a count of how much data is in my solution. So if I go and say, if I run my solution again and try to do uh, count equal true, that's not gonna work because the way how OData works, it tries to wrap your response in a, a, a another model that gives you that metadata that you need. So ideally when you're hitting an OData endpoint, if you do question mark dollar sign count equal true, it should give you the count. But there is no OData wrapper around your uh, response uh, object. So what you want to do here is enable the EDM, the EDM model. And we talked about this in a couple of blog posts. We talked about this in a video. We're going to do this real quick. So the first thing we want to do, we want to create an EDM model. So I'm going to go here and say private because this method is only needed for the startup CS uh, project. And I want to return I uh, EDM model if you do control period it'll pick that model for you and then you can do get edm model and then you want to build that uh, an edm basically like we said before is basically a liaison or a mapper an auto mapper between your raw data whatever that data is coming from it doesn't have to be entity framework based it doesn't have to be from anywhere in the world it has it could be a file with a bunch of text in it uh, EDM model tries to understand that and turns it into something that OData could work with. So the first thing we want to do is the model builder it is a variable and we want to say new uh, OData convention model builder. For those of you who are wondering why do we use var and when do we use var, not to go out on a tangent, as long as the right side in here is clear that you're initiating an OData convention model builder, you don't have to do it in here. I mean, this works as well. It's just a lot of a lot of code that you don't need to have. VAR makes it a shorthand and it's a lot better. So let's go here and say model builder. Now let's hook up our model builder with the um, uh, a, the students model that we're working with. Let's go in here and say entity set. And then I want to give that entity set my uh, model, which is the student, and then give it the, you know, the, 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 the set name that I want to work with. The set name that I want to work with here is the students. And then the last thing I want to do is return that model builder, which, which is the IDM model that I want. So that's basically the mapper reading whatever data you have and converting it into something OData could work with and could wrap put a wrapper around it to give you more metadata. So what I want to do is that get EDM model. There you go. All right, so that part is done. Now, let's enable some more features in here. So I want the count, I want the max top one, I want the uh, expand. I don't know if we're gonna need the expand, but it's in there. Now in the route builder itself, route builder, I want to include the EDM part. So my the name of my route is API. That's a name for you, for the developer. 
and then the prefix that's for the controller so it's slash api slash students and then we want to say get edm model when you use the edm model it's much better to use slash o data rather than slash api so the people that are consuming your endpoint they know they're dealing with o data not just a typical api but if you want to keep it to api that's fine as well now this wouldn't work because we are using .NET Core 2.2. Unfortunately, this is not something that you're supposed to do, but it's a little defect that we're working on. And what you want to add here, you want to add an add MVC core um, action, and you want to say, you know, disable the routing. Disable the routing so it doesn't try, ASP.NET Core doesn't try to override in your OData endpoint um, and it should just work with API. If you go to your controller, the last thing you want to do, OData already knows this is an API controller, so you don't need these tags. These tags are not needed. Now we just run. We're making sure you have enable query. Let's run our application here and let's see. Let's just verify that EDM model with OData, Cosmos DB, Entity Framework, and ASP.NET Core in general is all. They're all working together. Uh, in, a, in a cohesive way. So let's run the application here, slash API slash students. You'll notice here the EDM model. There's your wrapper right there. If you click on this, it'll explain what your model is, what it's made out of, the uh, data types, all that kind of stuff. But what's more important for us, if I do question mark dollar sign count equal true, it should give you back data count equal four, which is the number of the students in this particular uh, application which also means that um, if I do um, if I do select equal name or, or filter uh, filter equals uh, score what do we want score uh, larger uh, is it greater than um, well, all of them have the same score, so that's not going to work, but it should return nothing here, technically. Filter. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to put the uh, dollar sign behind filter. So that's the dollar sign. Queries, paper on that valid. Score is greater than 50. Right, what if we say score is greater than a hundred and twenty? It should come back with nothing. Perfect. But how does the count look like? Count equal true and filter the query. Do we need do we I don't think we need that dollar sign anymore in here. Still, count equal true and filter equal score. The query specified true is not a valid count option. What if the filter score was equal to 100? Would that work? Like this. That is still not working. Count equal true. What if I take the filter completely? So the problem is in the count option. Count equal, oh, I'm, I'm writing tour instead of true because I don't know how to spell. So if I do true, boom, there you go. And then if I say score greater than 120, so it gives you the count right away uh, without having to uh, do extra work on the UI side. All right, so we know that this is working, which is great. Now, uh, on top of that API, we can add something else, which is page size. Page size equal uh, one. So now if I add page size on top of your controller method, now you get another URL in your OData wrapper response that is very, very helpful. And I'm gonna show you why this, this, this piece is very, very helpful. Let's run the application. When you hit students, it'll give you one by default because that's the page size. And it's gonna give you a URL called next link. 
This is what we call Hados links, links that are helping you navigate through the model, through the API. And if you hit that link, it'll give you the next person on the list. If you hit that link, you give you the next person on the list. And if you hit next, that's the fourth and the last person, and you see that link have disappeared. You don't have that link anymore. There's no more data to navigate. There's no more, more data to navigate. And that is very, very helpful. And I'm going to show you now why that is very helpful. So we got this link. We can now navigate through our data. Fantastic. Now. Let's build the UI around this. And we are going to build Blazor uh, application. Uh, go to ASP.NET Core Web Application. Uh, what's our solution called? Cosmos with odata.ui. Create. And then you have make sure you want to have uh, ASP.NET Core 3. You want to make sure you're enabling a preview version because it's, not, it's still in preview. Not for long, hopefully. Should be announced in September. But uh, for the time being, you want to uh, install .NET Core 3.0, the preview version, and you want to select Blazor. So I'm creating Blazor in here. All right, here's my Blazor solution. I'm going to right click here and do sit as startup project. And then I'm going to run my application just to make sure my Blazor application is working as it is expected to work. So let's do that real quick. All right, here's our Blazor solution. And if you go to fetch data, it'll give you a bunch of data. Great, instead of that forecast, weather forecast data, we want to add in students. We want it to fetch students data instead. So how do we do that? First of all, if you look at your Blazor solution, there is a little bit of work here. We want to add brokers, which is a folder. This is very organizational. Uh, standpoint brokers is is a folder that helps it, that can encapsulates all the classes all the logic that you need to call external services put a message on a queue do whatever you want external service stuff so it knows about building external things we want a, another folder that we're gonna call models and models obviously the models that you're working with we also want services services like this services is where we're going to build the service that's going to work with interface with your blazer application all right we have all that stuff let's start with the model everything every web application i've been working with so far if you're starting from scratch you want to start with a model and in our case here we're starting with a student model student model is going to be very similar to the one we have in here so i'm just going to copy that data it's not always the case but in this case yes this is a student model uh, we want to add a wrapper around that because if you remember our response here, not this response, where is our response? Uh, our response in our API was not exactly your model. It was actually a wrapper around that model and you want to build something that knows how to serialize that wrapper response into something that we can understand. So in here it'll be let me show you first the how it looks like so if I run my application so see this is value is where your model is right but in reality there is more more to it than that so this is a list of students but there is more to it than that there is this new things that OData adds um, on top of your response which is the wrapper so that means in the models area we're going to go back here and create a new model that we're going to call um, OData, uh, let's say API, students API response. So that's our response. And according to the response that we were just looking at, I saw a couple of things. I saw value, which we're going to call it, it's going to be a list of students. And we can call it here students, but when we serialize, we can use something called json property property this comes in out of the box with newton soft no get package which visual studio will help you find it and install it with a click of a button and then we could say the 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 value name what's the name of that value so or the property name so in our case here it's called just called value so that maps 
your JSON response into a property so that way you're not violating the rules of, of building models properties by having uppercase letter as students and at the same time uh, you are uh, serializing and getting the data exactly from the right property so that's one part but they had other two parts let's uh, let's take a look at, at the, the other two parts in here uh, I think the first one let's run that real quick let's just copy the exact names so we know how to map that data correctly let me run that real quick slash students so what kind of URLs do I have? I have this OData context part. I'm not sure I'm going to use that, at least not in this. Uh, let, let me copy that somewhere. I'm not sure I'm going to use that for this demo, but it's a nice to have. The one I care about is OData next link, which is this guy. Right, so now we don't need that solution. Let's do another JSON property at odata.context and that is just a string it's a URL that's in a string so uh, context we could just call it context also here's another property JSON property and let's call it odata dot uh, is it next URL I think next link next link and that also could be string next link like that all right so we have it we had a, a model two models one of them encapsulates the other the response and the students that come back from that response that's great now let's go and build the broker the broker is basically the the class that's going to responsible for going to be responsible for um, uh, calling your api so let's call it students api broker right all right, so what do we want in here? We want a public class that returns students API response. So it's returning students API response. There we go. And get uh, make API call like that. All right? Let's let's call it get students. Get students. Get students is better right and what this guy going to be responding with we want I want from here a, a an example this is the code that we can use to do an API call so let's copy that in here here so we need a base URL HTTP client just to make a UI uh, an API call and then we need a bunch of links so obviously this is an asynchronous task because we're making an API call, there you go. And what are we missing? The JSON convert. That's Newton Soft. We already pulled that guy. And then the students API response. Student students. Okay, let's just do that. All right. And then there's skip and top, which we could use to uh, navigate through the pages. I guess that's just from the blog. What I could use is just pass in the actual URL. If I can pass the URL, then there will be no problem with um, with navigating that data. So let's just say, uh, ideally, ideally, instead of the base URL, let's do a string next link. All right, next link. And let's set that to null by default. And if it's null, then we're just calling the base URL directly, right? And what's the base URL in this case? If you go to your API solution, you can find your, your base URL right here. Let's go back. And let's put in that base URL like right here. Right, so we, we should be setting this if and only if the API response is null, right? So let's say if next link, if next link, let's say next link is null, then make that call. Otherwise, and let's just make that URL instead of base URL because that's not really a URL. It's not just really just a USB URL anymore. 
URL anymore. And then instead, then just make next, next link. So that way, if I pass in next link, it'll use next link. If not, it'll just hit that endpoint, which is this guy slash API slash students. So that way, it's all clear, right? Great. So we have that. So we have that broker, which is great. What's that? Uh, null check can be simplified. Oh, I think. Okay, let's let Visual Studio play. See, that's <laughs> that's not what we. I I guess that'll be fine. Yeah, that'll be fine. So if it is, if it's not null, then return it. If it is null, then yeah, beautiful. Love Visual Studio. It'll help you write cleaner code way better. I was trying to use a ternary expression, but in this case, it's uh, it's doing much better. All right, <clears throat> we got that part out of the way. Uh, now let's go to the service part and let's add a service. And let's call it students service. And what this service is doing, it's basically just making the, UI, the, the API call. So uh, public... Um, what do I want? I want still the API response student student API response right and we could even encapsulate the next link. Let's build a private variable in here. Private read only uh, private string next link. And yeah, with the instantiation of this method here, you could say next link is null, right? And that's what we're going to be passing every time we make the call. So instead of that, we could just say a list of students, just return a list of students. And let's say this is the call get students. And where is let's let's define this uh, broker as well. So private um, is it students API broker? Here's our broker, the guy that knows how to talk to the API. Here's students API broker. Students API broker. And let's instantiate that guy as well. So it'll be this dot students API broker dot new students API broker. So this guy is instantiated. This guy should also be this. This is when you say this, you know, it's better than some people going in and doing something like that. That's not best practice. That underscore. That's something that got carried over from C and C plus plus days. I don't think it's it's a best practice anymore. All right. What this guy is doing is that we have a response, right? And we're gonna go say this dot students API broker dot get students. It will give us all the students. We don't have an X link, but we're gonna pass this because it is already null. And whatever comes out of that, we're gonna go and say next link, next link equals um, uh, this. Uh, what is it? Response dot next link. Response. What are you? What are we getting? Get students. Oh, we need to await that call. So it's async. Task. We need to await that call because that's an API asynchronous call. So let's await that call first and then let's say await. Another best practice thing for the people who are writing code. When you are building something um, like this and it needs a task, call it async at the end. That's the best practice here because when you do that, that means people will know that this is actually an API call, not a uh, just a normal call, not a synchronous call, it's asynchronous call. And when they see async, they say, oh, I need an await. So it's it's kind of best practice to do something like that. Now you have response and you need next link, right? And you're returning response dot, um, returning response dot students. So now we have the students. So that's all that this service is doing. Doing a little bit of business logic there just to handle the iteration of data, right? And then what we can do from now on is just go and say, uh, this is get, so every time you do get students, it'll go and update and keeps iterating, 
right? Let's go back to the UI. So where is, where is the UI? First of all, before we do any of that, let's register our service. So let's say services, add singleton, let's add our student uh, API broker. Let's add that guy first, we need that guy here. So we got that out of the way. And then services dot add singleton uh, this is that the students API broker and then we also want to add the student the student service is that what we call student service yes control get student service all right we added singletons so we don't never have to reinitiate these things again which is great all right, back to student service, so that's great. Now let's go to where the UI is. In the pages, there's like fetch data. So instead of using weather forecast service, let's change this into, first of all, using UI.models. <coughs> Excuse me. And then instead of this guy, what do I have? Uh, UI.models. And let's go and do student student service like this. So instead of brokers, we want services like this. And this here will be students service. So this guy is going to be the guy that pulls up uh, students. And as we go, let's say school students. Okay, this component demonstrates fetching data from a service. I guess that's fine. We have forecast here. Instead of forecast, let's call it students. Students. Bar student and students. Student and students. And what do we have for the student? We have their ID. We have their name. We have their score, I think. That's all we have. go all right so we have students students and the same thing in here so we're gonna put that student and and in Visual Studio you could actually do if you do alt select you can select a bunch of things at the same time and then you could just type in and it will be typing on four lines at the same time so it's student dot blah 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 so in this case student dot ID we don't need that too short string really this is student.name and this is student.score, right? So as we go, we're fixing this situation here. And then in, in the last thing in here, we have student, there's student. And I wonder if I need to pull in the model for student. Let's see if we can do multiple using in here. So using uh, Cosmos with odata.ui.models. We need that guy as well, so people know what student is. So, UI. Cosmos with odata. Dot UI dot models, right? And then we have the student model in here. So a student, and that's a list of students. And again, we're just fixing this guy, and this will be students service dot get students. It doesn't really have anything else to do here. All right. Uh, uh, Blazor is still angry at us. Let's just do a build and see if it will recognize all that stuff. The name students doesn't exist. Students. I might have misspelled students. Code. Students. Uh, let's see if I did that right. Dot UI. Dot models. I don't need a semicolon for that. Is my student public? Yeah. API response, is it public? Yeah. What's the last thing I need to do? Sometimes if I move that code portion up, sometimes it recognizes what it's doing. So maybe that'll work. I don't know. No, still. So we're just going to have to run the solution. We're going to have to clean up everything and run the solution and see if that'll work for us. 
Let's do that. Let's do clean. Clean that little project and then rebuild the project. All right, do we run anyway and see what happens? Let's fix the solution first to run multiple uh, startup projects at the same time. So we want to start the API first and then we want to start the, the UI. So let's move that API up there and now we're going to run. And let's see if things would work for us. Oh, it is it is mad at us. It doesn't exist. It doesn't recognize any of that stuff. Uh, why? Student on a net. Let's see list. Student. Okay, it doesn't recognize that block of code at all the code block. Does it recognize functions? Like this. I think functions would work. It should. Functions like that. Look at that. Functions work. Uh, students. Now it seems to be happy. I don't know. Uh, it should be. <laughs> it should be code. But I don't know, maybe it's a new version of something. It's still very beta, so let's do with functions. And then let's start and see if things will work the way we want them to work. So we are in Fitch data. You go to Fitch data, it'll get us all the, all the little pieces that we need to run our application. All right, so it started two things. It started the API, and then it started the... Uh, solution. So if I go to Fitch Data, what happens? Look at that. We can now see the data coming in, but we don't have a button in here that keeps making that call. We want to keep making that call and updating the list. So let's build a button in here to use OData to keep retrieving more things. So let's go here and say um, async task get next. And it's pretty much doing the same thing. So it's students await students service dot get students. And hopefully this way, but we need a button that does that. So let's add a button in here. Say button uh, on click. On click. Yeah, on click. And then we want to call that function. So it's called get next. Something like that. And let's give that button a name like next. Something in that in that realm, right? It should do it should basically every time you click on the button, it'll make that call. And then you you keep going forward with that. So let's see if that's the case. So get next meaning it's gonna call the student service. Go to implementation. Uh, already set link is already in place. So it's gonna make another call passing in the new set link and then get in more data. Is that the case? I don't know. Let's find out. Here is the API. Here's the UI. Both of them are rendered. Get data. Here's a button. Look, the button is navigating through the data. And eventually, now it shouldn't do anything. Oh, it goes up to the top again. That's fantastic. So as you can see, you're using we're using OData to pass in a link. Keep passing the link. And it keeps going forward with that. And uh, it, it basically, it's the simplest implementation ever you know, to uh, write C sharp in the browser, retrieve some information and keep navigating through uh, students. Obviously, I personally, like if you have more data, it'll, it'll look much better, but that's pretty much uh, OData integration with, so if we're talking to Cosmos, we're living in ASP.NET Core, we are uh, building uh, an, a, 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 an API that generates a next link for us for our data, but at the same time, it's also um, 
uh, integrated with Blazor to navigate that data. That's pretty much it. Sorry about the long video. Uh, this is a 34 minute video. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm going to push this out there uh, on GitHub so you can look at the solution and see. Obviously, you're going to have to create your own uh, Azure instance for Cosmos DB so you can play with the data. But other than that, uh, all should be good. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, drop it in the comment section. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in another video.